there's a consequence for our sins. There's a consequence for our behavior. And again, uh, we learn by repetition. There was a time whenever I thought uh, it would be my children and my grandchildren that have to deal with the end times. <laughs> but folks, they are coming upon us rapidly. And our own nation is beginning to uh, crumble in more ways than we would care to admit. Uh, I shared with my uncle last night, uh, my mom's uh, older brother, Vivian, and his wife, Madge, uh, from Illinois, are here with us today. I shared with him at dinner that I was sharing a politically incorrect message today. And this, I know for you, you're going, well, what's so different about that, you know? But I want to let him know ahead of time uh, because of the times that we are living in. And there are more and more ministers that are going ahead and sharing these things. Many, the majority, will not. They will not. Because there are many within their congregations that don't like to see the boat rocked. They don't want to uh, consider the consequences of what it's going to take to make a difference, to make an impact. Can't we just all get along? You know? Listen to this quote by a famous American, and his words are chilling. To ignore the danger of aggression is simply to invite it. We shall doom our children to a struggle that may take our lives, their lives. We know that unless free people stand boldly and united against the forces of aggression, they may fall wretchedly, one by one, into the web of oppression. Those are haunting words, and they were spoke 68 years ago by four-star general Omar Bradley, one of the most famous American generals in World War II. What I find interesting and scary <laughs> is that those words are as relevant today as they were then. Much like scripture is as relevant now as it ever was. Listen carefully. Though there are usually at least 20 or more armed conflicts going on around the planet at any moment, like at this moment, the aggression that should concern us most is of a more subtle nature. Satan would use those things to distract us from what is really happening. Hank Hanegraaff says this, the Bible answer man, it is a relentless assault on life, on truth and common decency right here in our own backyards. You know, the Roman Empire was not brought down from the outside until it crumbled from the inside. I'm keenly aware that when a voice like mine is raised in warning over the deteriorating spiritual uh, and moral conditions within America, there are always going to be those who go, oh, here we go again. Call, you're an alarmist. It's not that bad. They say we're crying wolf, but we also know from history that there were those in the Titanic who calmly disregarded the iceberg warnings, <laughs> you know. Uh, and they continued full speed ahead as if nothing were wrong. Uh, there were those in the early days of Nazi Germany who chose to ignore some signs uh, that could quickly lead to genocide and world war. And so they did. And there are those in America who still think our military, our industrial might, our techno technological advances, along with our seemingly unending ability to print money, will keep us firmly on top of the world's food chain, no matter who's running the country. If you disagree with me, and the facts that I present in these messages and have been presenting, entitled The Death of Common Sense, that's your free choice. But if you disagree, let me encourage you to do something. Instead of going on someplace like Facebook and calling me stupid, I encourage you to come present your own carefully studied findings to me personally, face to face. Don't be a coward. You come and talk to me face to face, and you're going to get a fair hearing. And no matter how much you and I disagree, I will not resort to calling you names. Okay? Fair enough? All right, let's begin with the scripture that's the foundation of this entire series of messages, the death of common sense. Paul wrote, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. They're suppressing the truth. 
since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, that is, His eternal power, His divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are what? Without excuse. None of us have an excuse. You can see plainly. If you have a brain, you can see what has been made and recognize a designer put this together. Again, you've heard me say, people don't have any trouble. Uh, remember those little uh, Ford Pintos? And what was the, the Chevy, the Chevelle, Chevette or whatever it was? Chevelles were cool. I think Chevettes. There was the Vegas. <laughs> those were pretty nasty. I remember those. Uh, we'd have no trouble believing that those were designed as flawed as they were and built. <laughs> we can look at something far more grand, look at the universe and say it just happened over time. No, I don't think so. For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him. But their thinking, what? Became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. You've always heard me say, God gets a kick out of taking the least and doing the most with it. He's not always looking for the smartest people, the most gifted people, the people that come from the, the best backgrounds. He likes taking the least and doing the most with it sometimes. Maybe the most uneducated, the most untalented, the least popular, the weakest, the foolish things that the world would consider and doing the most with them because it proves what? He did it. He used you to get something accomplished. The First Amendment to the Constitution reads, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people to assemble, as we're seeing some of that happening, and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. So according to the Con Constitution of the United States, no branch of our government is allowed to interfere with the church's ability to worship as we please, to function as we please, and to teach the truth as we see it. The government cannot impose its wishes over our beliefs. And we have the freedom to shout our beliefs from the rooftops if we so desire. We have the right to rebuke the government when our moral compass says that they are straying from the truth. Those of you who have known me for even a short time recognize the depth of feeling I have for our nation. Though there are a growing number within our government attempting to deny the truth, you've watched, you've listened, as I've proven beyond a shadow of a doubt that America was founded on biblical principles. I've shown that again and again. I've revealed in black and white many of our founding documents, charters still on record proving that our earliest settlements and colonies were founded with the purpose of what? Evangelizing the new world to Jesus Christ. That was their purpose. You've listened to quote after quote from our founding fathers for last week, even concerning the role Christianity and the Word of God was designed to play in the development of these United States. I, be I believe that there's no question. It was because of these firm biblical principles, the foundation that was carefully, thoughtfully laid that America sprung from a vast wilderness to become not only the world's leading superpower, but the guardian of the planet. God honored the foundation. Agree? Almost 80 years following the birth of our nation, there came one of the first serious attempts to begin eroding America's biblical and moral foundation. In 1844, a man by the name of Stephen Gerard, he had died and left the city of Philadelphia $7 million. Now in 1844, that's a lot of money. It's a lot of money today, but it was a, just an incredible amount of money back then. He left them that money to build an orphanage and a school. Cool. I mean, that's great. But his only stipulation was that the Bible and its teaching not be allowed on the premises. It was an all or nothing deal. You see, up to this point, the Bible was included in secular schools. That was, it, was, it was the primary book in all public school teaching. In fact, we've said 
that out of like the first 278 uh, colleges and universities in America, like 260 of them were founded by churches or religious organizations or ministers, including Yale, Dartmouth, Harvard, William and Mary, almost all these big Ivy League schools, they all started off as seminaries. But get this, and we'd find this hard to imagine today. Though Stephen Girard's executors and a few businessmen were eager to move forward with the project, you know what? Philadelphia's city fathers and the majority of the population said no. They were so against the idea of the Bible being left out of the teaching of their youth they hired famed attorney Daniel Webster to stop the process in court. It went all the way to the Supreme Court. And you're thinking, oh, well, there we go. No, back then, the Supreme Court upheld, rendering a nine-to-nothing ruling, famously stating, why may not the Bible, and especially the New Testament, be read and taught as divine revelation in the schools? Where can the purest principles of morality be learned so clearly or perfectly as from the New Testament? This was the Supreme Court. Nine to nothing. This was their finding. Now what's that old saying? We've come a long way, baby. Unfortunately, now we'd like to blame the government, but we as Christians stand fully to blame. Christians did not faithfully continue to do their part over the next 120 years, as uh, had been uh, told by the Lord and Moses to the people in Deuteronomy chapter 6, telling us that we were to pass on our beliefs, pass on the principles of the Ten Commandments, pass on the laws to our children, to our grandchildren. Our founding fathers fully intended every American citizen be biblically educated and to keep any future government from running roughshod over its citizens. That had happened in Europe. Many of them had lived it. Each succeeding generation of Americans became more and more biblically illiterate. It used to be I could stand in front of a congregation almost anywhere and say, oh, let's all recite uh, John 3.16. Now, as I look around the room, whenever I'm doing that, you know what? There's fully a third to half in many congregations that can't do it. If you haven't got it up there on the screen, that's amazing. The greater majority of Americans failed to pass the truths found within Scripture to their children. So because of this, the failed ideologies, the failed teachings, the failed foundations of many of those European governments crept across the Atlantic and became firmly entrenched within our own educational system. In time, the graduates of these educational systems gained positions of prominence. It takes time, little at a time, little at a time. They gained positions of authority within the government and within the judicial system. So by 1962 and 63, many of you know what happened then. If you were alive, the Supreme Court reversed its previous common sense rulings, now stating that prayer and Bible reading were unconstitutional. They had been constitutional. Suddenly, they were un had the Constitution changed? No. The people changed. Their thinking changed. They became, their thoughts became futile, darkened. So it became unconstitutional. Read the Bible and have prayer within the American public school system. But the rest of it, from 50, those 50 years from here to now, are just a coincidence, the rapid moral decline in our society. Oh. No, they are directly related. And you've seen, I've carefully chronicled the things that have taken place since then within other sermons and, and my dissertation. And if you still have any doubts, just, here's a simple way. Just think, what was common fare on TV 50 years ago? 20 years ago? What is prime time like now? Our media reflects our culture. The United States flourished, rose to power on the foundation of biblical truth. Whether the government says that's true or not doesn't make any difference. Truth states there is right and there is wrong. America as a nation at one time stood for right versus evil. And that's part of what made her great. Think about it. Where evil 
prevailed, where tragedy struck, who was the first to send boots on the ground? Who was the first to send help? Everybody go ahead and turn around and look. They made it. They made it out that back door. All right. Who was the first to send aid? Who was the first to send soldiers? For those reasons, many people around the world were willing to risk their lives to get to this nation. They risked their lives. They, they spent everything they had to come here. And it's also why more than another million American soldiers were willing to give their lives in her defense. But as the Word of God clearly states in James 1, 22 through 25, we're going to be getting there as soon as we finish Hebrews. We're going to be looking at James. The Bible is a mirror. The Word of God reveals the truth by shining a light on our lives. Listen to what he said. Do not merely listen to the Word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the Word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself he goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. Did nothing to change the appearance. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that, get this, gives what? Freedom. And continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. Silly question here, but do you want God's hand of blessing on your life? Do you want him to bless everything you put your hand to? Everything you, you're led to? Don't you want to be led by God when it comes to certain directions? Uh, how to raise your children? Uh, how to work your way through certain financial situations? Don't you want your hand of blessing when it comes to every decision in your life? Medical, financial, family, whatever that is. Don't you want God to guide you and lead you? He just said. Look intently into the perfect law. It gives freedom. Continue to do this. You'll be blessed in what you do. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and what? He will direct your paths. He will show you. This is the path, Rick. This is the path. Don't, don't lean. Don't look over there. You stay right here. Stay focused. Don't lose your focus. Jesus said this, If you hold to my teaching, you're really my disciples. That's pretty plain. Then you're going to know the truth, and the truth will set you free. See, everybody who sins, he says, they're a slave. They're not free. They're a slave to sin. They're bound to it. But if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Do you want God's blessing on all you do? <laughs> sin binds us. Truth sets us free. Sets us free from, from sin, from guilt, from uncertainty. God blesses His kids who obey Him. That's simple. That's common sense. Again, you don't need me to remind you that in America today there are a growing number of organizations and a rising political agenda that view Christianity as the enemy. You and I, if you're a true child of God, you are being viewed more and more as the enemy simply because the truth of Scripture and common sense are all that stand in the way of those who are trying to remake America into a progressive socialist empire. And if you want to know what those things are, come talk to me if you have any doubts. And, and to these socialist progressive, if that means truth and the Bible, as it claims it to be, must be obliterated, then death to truth and common sense. Many Americans, many of you in this room, never dreamed that our Constitution, with all of its safeguards, its checks, and its balances that are supposed to protect you and I from abuses of power, would so quickly be disregarded in just one administration with so many challenges to that abuse. There are presently 13 states, including Oklahoma and Texas, that are challenging this administration's transgender bathroom decree. Whether you think that's important or not, let me just tell you this. What is accepted and allowed by one generation becomes the common practice of the next. You understand that? Just eight or ten years ago, who would have thought we'd seriously be arguing over whether or not a man who happens to feel like a natural woman on any given day 
should be allowed to enter any woman's restroom he feels inclined to enter whenever he wants to. And we'd better not say anything about it or we're hateful and we're discriminatory and we're the guilty ones. I'll tell you, that man is either messed up and denying the truth of who he is or he's attempting to take advantage of a broken political system. And I think that second one is the one that's more, more accurate. If such a man is genuine, genuinely committed to being a woman, then he also needs to commit to some serious surgery. Because he'll be plumbed correctly, and he'll no longer have the glands that'll make him a physical danger to the women and the young girls in that restroom. And that's about as plain as I can put it. Such a silly argument today is beyond the boundaries of common sense. And yet it's common conversation every single day. Like this is something serious we need to be considering. It's ridiculous. America was founded as a nation of common sense laws with limited government in a manner where the will of the majority settled any issue. Now a president can bypass Congress and enforce the will of less than 1% of the population on the 90 and 9. And we're just supposed to let that happen. He even threatens that majority with serious consequences should they not fully comply with his wishes. Wad up the Constitution. Throw it away. All right. So sadly, it's come this far. Surely, the third branch of government, the judiciary, should recognize the unconstitutionality of such abuse of power and come to America's rescue. But in a growing number of cases, that's not happening. Over the years, since enough of the progressive socialists have made their way to the judicial benches all over America, the present administration can always find at least one judge that will support any ruling, no matter how ridiculous that ruling is. And usually that seems to be all that it takes for some silly nonsense to become the standing law of the land. Liberal courts are now reinterpreting the intent of the Constitution. The Ninth Circus, I mean, Ninth Circuit Court uh, just recently said the Second Amendment, uh, the right to bear arms does not mean the right to bear arms. I can't wait to see what that really means. I'm, I'm just hanging, you know by fingernails, wanting to see what that means. But the D.C. Circuit Court, that over the day, they backed them up immediately. Surprise. Liberal courts, they reinterpret the intent of the Constitution. To do that, they have to do away with what it literally says. In essence, the courts are then rewriting the law because they are rewriting the literalness of the Constitution. According to the Constitution, making laws is supposed to be the job of who? Congress, not the courts. And just the past week, a Church of Christ in Iowa is having to put up their own money to challenge the city of Des Moines' policy, which will not only force churches to make restroom facilities available to transgender individuals, but also censor any teaching against it, including their printed materials down to their bulletins saying the men's rooms are located in this part of the building, the women's rooms are located in this part of the building. You better say where the transgender bathroom is or you're guilty of hate crimes and discrimination. They're having to go to court and pay money. This is just too weird and nonsensical to make up. Hate speech, discrimination. The legal counsel for the church, uh, Christina Holcomb, she said, Churches should be free to teach their religious beliefs and operate their houses of worship according to their faith without being threatened by the government. That is a First Amendment principle. The first. Churches have been protected from government intrusion. One can hardly imagine a more unconstitutional invasion of the state into the affairs of the church. If you've been listening, states and school systems who do not comply with the recent presidential proclamation about transgender restrooms and locker rooms have already been informed by the president through the media that if they do not comply with the transgender policy, 
federal funding may be cut in the near future or tax exempt status revoked. I know there's always been people again who say don't, they don't want to get involved. I, I just stay out of politics. That sounds so, so good. I, I just stay out of politics. But if I'm not mistaken, Jesus talked about those who don't want to get involved in the parable of the Good Samaritan. There have been the, those who say, let's not rock the boat. And some of their bones lay at the bottom of the North Atlantic in the wreck of the Titanic. But 240 years ago, there were those, thankfully, who recognized they were being abused by a tyrant who refused to their, listen to their pleas and didn't allow them to be represented adequately. And though they did so reluctantly, they did not want to do it. But after trying everything else and at great cost to their own lives and to their property, when the tyrant decided to enforce his unfair will upon them, the earliest Americans took up their squirrel guns and did something about it. They said, that's enough. You and I can still freely step into a voting booth and say, that's enough. We're going to do something about it. And that's still our best option. So don't anybody go away from here saying, Brother Rick says we need to revolt. It's not what I said. It's recorded. It's on the video. All right? Voting is still our best option. As I see it, there are four things that stand in the way of the runaway train that's become at least two branches of our government. The truth stands in the way. Common sense stands in the way. The Constitution is standing in the way, even though it's starting to be shredded bit by bit. And the church, that is Christians, are standing in the way of progressive socialism. Serious attempts are being made by LGBT. That's lesbian, gay, transgender, and bisexual organizations. And by the executive branch of government and a growing number of sitting judges in the, judi in the judicial branch of government to aggressively suppress the truth. That includes the Word of God. And to do away with as much of the Constitution as they can get away with. It stands in their way. Remember, as Omar Bradley put it, to ignore the danger of aggression is simply to what? Invite it. What did Edmund Burke say? All that's necessary for evil to prevail is for good men to do nothing. Jesus never told us to accept the fact that evil would continue to grow unchecked. There are many today who have not read the book carefully enough that want to sound holy and they say, well, Brother Rick, doesn't the Bible say it's just going to get worse and worse and worse? So we just got to accept that. No. He called you and I to be salt and light to preserve against decay, and to push back the darkness for as long as possible. Remember, he backed that up. He is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The longer we push it back, one more can be saved here. One more can be saved there. One more Christian can come to their senses. He wants us to preserve our society from decay with great enthusiasm for as long as possible until he comes. Amen? There's more than likely going to come a day when the American church, in some of your lifetimes, maybe in mine, I don't know. Because it's, I mean, this, this last seven, eight years has been absolutely amazing. How quickly, how far we have come. There's going to come a day when the American church is forced to go underground. And just as many churches and socialist countries around the world have had to do. You know what's interesting? Those churches that are forced to go underground... They thrive. They thrive. It's almost like we need a good dose of deprivation and persecution. It weeds out those who are not sincere. And you've got the hardcore sold out Christians that are willing to do whatever it takes. How sold out are you? Truth and common sense stand in the way of the evil one. So please recognize that the people who come against the church, listen, those who come against the church, 
these organizations that I'm talking about, those in the government that I'm talking about, they don't even realize that they are simple, unwitting pawns in the hand of the evil one. We need to pray for them. Jesus said, pray for those who persecute you. Pray for them. Recognize it. They don't understand the full consequences of their actions or of their doom should they refuse to accept the truth. The Bible says their thinking is darkened, it's become futile, as Paul said in Romans. So sincerely pray for them. Let me close with these words of the Apostle Paul, found in Ephesians 6, 10 through 13. If you've got your highlighters and you haven't got this highlighted, you need to. Ephesians 6, 10 through 13. Even though it's up here, I encourage you to underline it, highlight it in your Bible. Paul says in Ephesians 6, 10 through 13, Be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so when the day of evil comes, and it's coming, it's here, so when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, when the smoke clears, you're still standing for what's true. Next time, I'm going to show you why a growing number of people within the government are so set on doing away with the Americans' Second Amendment rights. Don't just swallow what I'm saying. Study it for yourself before next week and we can compare notes. I'm just getting warmed up. If you would, bow with me. I've been to Washington, D.C. with Nancy. We've seen the wall. Uh, we've seen uh, all 50,000 names on the wall from Vietnam. I've been uh, in Branson to the, uh, um, the American War Museum there where they have all the names of all the soldiers that they can possibly have uh, that have died in, in conflicts. I've been there. I've seen my uncle's name, my dad's brother who was killed in North Korea. I've seen his name. They've given their lives for our freedom so that the truth can go marching on and we can continue to live in, a, in America. Likewise, think about this. Jesus died on an ugly wooden cross so that you and I could live free. You'll know the truth. It will set you free. You understand what he's saying? You can live free from the bondage of sin and guilt. You can experience true peace in the middle of the storm. No matter what tomorrow's headlines say, you can still have peace that no one can take away from you knowing that He is in control and He's in control of your life. No matter what happens, you're His, even in a messed up world. Belief in what Jesus did is the only way you can have that freedom and peace. Some of you here today, I'm going to venture in a crowd this size, you need that. You need that right now. Not tomorrow. Don't let me think about it and then come back later. There might, you might not have the tomorrow. You need to get that settled right now. Jesus is truth in the flesh. He said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. That's truth, and that's about as plain as it gets. Believe that. Accept him today. I wouldn't dare want another day in this fallen world apart from Jesus Christ. Father, I pray right now that your Holy Spirit has dealt with some in this room. Lord, I pray that if there's someone in this room today that is recognizing, maybe for the first time, or you've been dealing with them for some time now about their, their salvation, that they don't know you, they've never placed their faith and their trust in what you did for them on the cross of Calvary, that they will be so overwhelmed by the truth of what they have heard today. Not wanting to go on another minute without you in their lives, having control in their lives. Lord, and today they will cry out, Lord, save me. I need you. Lord, they'll come and tell one of us this is what they've done. They'll confess their sins and recognize that you died on the cross for them. 
you paid for their mistakes so that they can go to heaven someday. But on top of that, before then, to live a life that matters with meaning in this world. Lord, if there are others in this room, Christians today, that have not been all in, they've just been kind of letting things go on by and shaking their heads at how bad things are, but they haven't been willing to do anything about it, really. Lord, I pray that today they will rededicate themselves to your service, to being an, a, a soldier on the front lines, standing for what is true, willing to do whatever you ask them to do, to push back the darkness another day. Lord, there may be some here today that need to trust this or become parts of this church family. They, they need to be members here, right here in this place, and get involved in what's going on. I pray that they will respond today, whatever their need.